It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Dean's first speaker series event of the year. Tonight, we are discussing the Affordable Care Act ruling. This discussion will be the first in a series of events around the topic, the challenge of change. And the Price School is all about challenge, change, and making a difference. I'm Jim Lewis, Chair of the Leadership Council for the USC Price Athenian Society. I'll tell you about that in just a moment. The Athenian Society is the premier philanthropic support group for the Sol Price School of Public Policy. Athenian Society members are committed to the mission of the USC Price School to improve the quality of life for people and communities here and abroad. I know there's a few of us in the Athenian Society this evening. If you're a member of the Athenian Society or make an annual fund gift to our school, could you please rise and be recognized? You know the McCarthys are there, a few of you. Thank you very much. Our Athenian Society members really are the ones that provide the Dean with the resources to make a difference through student scholarships, research, discretionary programs. These are the monies that help us make and impact change. These are the monies that will change Los Angeles, California, our world. And at the Price School, we care and we're the school at this university that makes the difference, that impacts change. And so I would call on all of you, if you are not a member, to join the Athenian Society and commit yourself to the Price School and help our Dean Jack Knott move forward along with the faculty to impact change. This support is critical to our collective success. You can become a member this evening by supporting the school with an annual minimum gift of $1,500 a year. There are membership materials throughout the room, or I, of course, would be happy to see you or any member of the staff. And we hope you'll join us in supporting our school's successful future. Membership will provide you, among other things, access to the cutting edge research and scholarship taking place at the Price School and to a host of networking and professional development opportunities, along with the satisfaction, again, of knowing you are impacting change. In particular, Athenian members are invited to attend events such as this one, featuring industry leaders in a variety of topics who provide insider information on pressing issues of the day, connecting scholars, policymakers, and practitioners. More events are planned throughout the year as are opportunities for members of the Athenian Society to network and engage. I'm sure you're eager to hear what our distinguished panelists have to say, and I've met with them earlier. I think they have many great things to say. I, too, am eager. And so I'll turn you over to our Dean of the USC Price School of Public Policy, Jack Knott. Dean Knott is the C. Irwin and Ion L. Piper Dean and Professor of the USC Price School. Before joining USC, and we're sure glad you did, we continue to be so, he served as Professor of Political Science and Director of the Institute of Government and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He is a leading scholar in the fields of political institutions and public policy and management. He has published three books, including Reforming Bureaucracy, The Politics of Institutional Choice, numerous journal articles, and book chapters. He has held fellowships from the Russell Sage Foundation in New York City and the International Institute of Management in Berlin. In 2007, Dean Knott was elected as a fellow to the National Academy of Public Administration, a nonpartisan organization chartered by the U.S. Congress to assist federal, state, and local governments improve their effectiveness, efficiency, and accountability. Please join me in welcoming our leader and friend, Dean Jack Knott. Thank you, Jim. That was very, very nice of you. Uh, and I'm really pleased for all the work that Jim does uh, for the university and especially for our school. He's just a tremendous leader. And we're very happy to have him as part of the school and in this role. Uh, good evening, everyone. On uh, behalf of the school, I'm really pleased to welcome you to this important event on this special topic. And it's great to see so many of you join us here tonight. Uh, in this gorgeous setting overlooking the city of Los Angeles. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to take a moment and recognize a few people are, who are here. A couple have been recognized already, but it's worth uh, recognizing them again. And I just want to start uh, with Jim Lewis, who is the interim chair of our Price uh, Athenian Leadership Council and assistant city manager uh, for the city of, of Tascadero. So uh, could we give Jim a round of applause? 
Uh, I also want to recognize Mike Lowe. Uh, he's the chair uh, of the USC Price Alumni Board and Managing Director of London Pacific Partners. And where are you, Mike? Are you here? Great. Thank you for coming. And uh, Kevin and Yvette McCarthy. Uh, Kevin is uh, a USC Price Board of Counselors member. Uh, he is the Senior Vice President of Majestic Realty and Kevin and Yvette serve on the Price Athenian Leadership Council, and they are also Price parents. So uh, we really need to thank <laughs> Kevin and Yvette. And uh, the mentor to all of us, including many of the people on the panel, uh, we want to recognize Yoshi Hankawa. Uh, Yoshi is the Board of Counselors member, longtime Board of Counselors member, advisor to me and previous deans. Uh, and a major figure in the healthcare industry for many years uh, and uh, now serves as a consultant to Cedar sinai So welcome, Yoshi. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and I think uh, Greg and Nancy Silver are here as well. Uh, there you are. Uh, Nancy is on the Athenian Leadership Council and uh, Greg and Nancy are also Price parents. So welcome to both of you. And, uh, I'd also like to welcome the faculty, Mike Nickel, who we will, I will introduce in a moment, uh, Bob Myrtle, uh, Lavana Lewis, and uh, Thompson Ong. Is our, everyone here? Could you raise your hands? Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a very special person to me, and that is the Associate Dean of the USC School of Social Work, uh, Cherry Short, who also happens to be my darling wife. So, <laughs> Cherry. So I thank each and every one of you for your support, uh, guidance, invite, advice, and commitment to our school. And uh, I'm really thankful for all that the Athenian Society and all of you, all of the things that you've done for us. And of course, uh, I want to thank, extend a special thank you to the Athenian Leadership Council because they take an extra special effort. They not only give of their uh, financial resources, but they give of their time and commitment uh, to work with us, and that's absolutely critical. So thank you very much. Uh, as was mentioned, this year our theme is a uh, challenge of change, and tonight we're going to focus on our change in our healthcare delivery system. Later this fall, we will look at potential change in national governance and politics. And in the winter, we'll examine the myriad challenges for change facing the state of California. And each challenge uh, requires thoughtful, forward-thinking, evidence-based approaches to public policy and governance. And we as a school are committed to providing that kind of insight and analysis for change in our country. Uh, indeed, our decision uh, uh, and discussion this evening on the Affordable Care Act couldn't really be more timely or more relevant. Uh, and conveniently for tonight's forum, uh, the Census Bureau released last week uh, the latest data on the health care in the U.S. Uh, and I just want to give a quick overview of that report. Uh, there's some good news, and the good news is that the number of uninsured Americans in 2011 declined by about 1.3 million, which set the total at 48.6 million people. And for the fifth straight year, there was an increase in government coverage of Medicaid, Medicare, and the Children's Health Insurance Program, adding about 3 million uh, more people uh, than the pre uh, year previous. But of course, uh, the bad news is that we still have 48.6 million people who, uh, and almost 10% of children in the United States who are still uninsured. They have no health insurance. But the challenges facing our healthcare system are much more complicated than extending insurance. Uh, we face cost projections that are simply unsustainable, wide variability in quality of care, severe inefficiencies in healthcare delivery, and inequalities in access to types of care. And the challenge is to find a path that addresses these issues and also extends insurance and access coverage to everyone in the society. And that is a really big challenge uh, politically, economically, and institutionally. And we're looking forward to what our panel has to say about that this evening. 
But given these uh, issues, uh, it is very difficult to understate, understate the importance of national health care reform. Among all really the pressing domestic issues that face our country, none is really more important uh, than the debate around the Affordable Care Act. And this topic, I think, has uh, the potential to affect each one of us as citizens, uh, whether we're uh, of one social economic class or another, or one age or another. It's the one policy that affects everybody in this room. So, uh, and it's also, as you know, emerged as a very heated aspect of the political debate going on in the elections right now. So we're committed to making a positive impact on health policy and administration through our degree programs, uh, which prepare future leaders uh, to run healthcare organizations and uh, also to make contributions to health policy. And we aim to be a source of valuable expertise through our research by the faculty and at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, which should help decision makers in this policy arena. And so today, uh, we're really pleased to be able to bring together a distinguished panel of industry experts uh, representing different professional backgrounds who will lead us in a discussion on the Affordable Care Act and its far-reaching -re implications. So I'd like at this time to introduce our moderator, uh, Professor and Dr. Mike Nickel, uh, Mike is the director of USC Price School Graduate Programs in Health. And under his leadership, uh, our school has really substantially and strategically revised and reinvigorated both the Master of Health Administration and the Executive Master of Health Administration to the point where I think these are really model programs in the country and it was uh, largely due to his leadership working with the faculty to make that happen and I'm very appreciative of that. He led the redesign of the Executive MHA into an innovative model that blends online and on the ground curriculum. He also worked with the faculty to restructure the MHA program to focus on key areas which serve as critical health priorities for the future, including health management, quality of care, finance, policy analysis, and information technology. We have those five areas that the program now focuses on. In addition, he's worked very closely with alumni and employers to secure residencies, internships, and indeed jobs uh, uh, for our students in these areas. And uh, in addition to all that, he's a noted scholar uh, of health policy, health economics, healthcare costs and resource utilization. And uh, in addition to a, a major appointment in our school, he also holds appointment in the USC School of Pharmacy and in the USC Davis School of Gerontology. So. Um, Mike has uh, a long uh, history with the Trojan family, having received his PhD, uh, I won't say what year, uh, from Thank the Price you. School. <laughs> and I think he's a great candidate to be an alumnus a member of the Athenian Society, don't you think? So anyway, uh, welcome, uh, Mike, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Dean Nott, I really appreciate it. Uh, we're very excited about this program for a number of reasons. Jack's outlined a, a few of them. Uh, we're also very excited about our Master's in Health Administration as well as the Executive Master's in Health Administration as, as Jack has indicated. You've already met our faculty. Um, please take an opportunity to go by and, and talk to them sometime tonight. What I'd also like to do though tonight, we have a number of our students and alums here. So if you would, if you're a student or an alum of the Health Administration program, raise your hand. Oh, I love it. This is great. One of the things that, that Dean Knott didn't mention is that while we've expanded our program, we've also gotten an incredible number of very, very talented young people within our MHA program. I strongly recommend that you, if you get a chance, talk to them tonight. Just go up and have a little discussion because these are the people that are going to be the future leaders. And those of us that are moving our way into Medicare, they're the ones that are going to take care of us. Um, the other thing that, that we're really very excited about uh, is that we do have such a distinguished panel tonight. The format for this uh, session tonight, we're going to have a, a probably about 30 minutes worth of questions that I get to direct to our panelists. And then we're going to have plenty of time for you to have questions. Uh, so if you don't already have a set of two or three that you've got in mind, start thinking about them right now. 
Um, so first, let me introduce some of our outstanding panelists here. Uh, first, on my right, Dr. Benjamin Chu. He is Southern California Regional President of Kaiser Permanente and Group President for Southern California and Hawaii regions. So he's got some tough travel that he has to do. <laughs> he directs health plan and hospital operations for 14 hospitals and 168 medical offices, serving more than 3.6 million people. Before joining Kaiser, he served three years as President of New York City's Health and Hospitals Corporation, the largest public hospital system in the country. So he knows pain, okay? He really knows pain. <laughs> Mark Gamble is Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Hospital Association of Southern California, a nonprofit trade association comprised of 181 member hospitals. He is the Senior Executive of the division responsible for providing hospitals with programs and services relating to quality and patient safety, performance improvement, operational data analytics, human resource management, and patient access services. Obviously a very large portfolio. He is also the chair of our newly reconstituted Health Advisory Board, and we are indebted that he is spending the time to help direct the future development of the educational process here at USC Price School. Um, finally, appointed by President Obama, Herb Schultz serves as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Director of the region encompassing Arizona, California, Nevada, Hawaii, and several U.S. territories in the Pacific. He is HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius's key representative in the region, ensuring the federal government's close contact with state, local, tribal, regional, and non-governmental partners on a range of health and social services uh, issues. What we've asked Herb to do, Herb's going to start us off, and we've given him a supremely difficult task, which is to tee up this whole issue in about five minutes. <laughs> He said, not a problem, of course. <laughs> so Herb, if you would, perhaps you might be able to fill us in on some of the things that have especially been happening since the uh, Supreme Court decision related to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Okay, I was gonna stand, is this on? Yes. I was gonna stand out front, but maybe because we're sitting and we're doing this this way, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this. I wanna make one pre-comment, it doesn't count about my five minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> one, thank the Dean, thank Jim, thank the Athenian Society. How many of you are members? Just, okay. How many of you are going to become members when you graduate from this? <laughs> okay, I have one confession to make. So I was talking to a, a wonderful uh, person, I won't identify you to embarrass you, but I was talking to one person uh, uh, a little bit earlier and I said, I have a master's in public policy. And so she very nicely assumed that it was from uh, the USC. <laughs> and when I said I didn't go to USC, she started talking about the Bruins. <laughs> and I, I wanted to say, do you get this East Coast accent? <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, I have a master's in public policy. Uh, I have it from Georgetown University. But I hope that the lectures that I've done, the fact that you all wanted me to teach a course and President Obama got in the way and said, no, you can't teach a course when you're now uh, employed by the federal government. So I was going to teach a politics and policy of healthcare reform class about two and a half years ago. So anyway, but, but I digress. So I'll go into to this. So this is a very hard assignment. And I'm just going to try and sort of do it because we have a lot of time to have discussion amongst the audience. How many of you feel like you are very knowledgeable or expert in the Affordable Care Act? <laughs> okay, that's usually more. That's because it's USC and you all know that. But let me, let me sort of make a couple of comments. One is whether you're a consumer, whether you're a provider, whether you're a health plan, whether you're labor, whether you're a business, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a community member, an academic, a philanthropic organization, now is the time post-Supreme Court, which we in the Obama administration always did believe that the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act was going to be upheld. And so we haven't stopped one day and sort of wondering, was this going to happen or that happened? We've been focused since um, March 23rd, 2010 on implementation. But what does that all mean, I think, for all of you? And regardless of whether you're any of those or other categories, now is the time that you individually, in your families, as a school, and as community members, now is the time to control your own destiny. Because while we have the federal framework and we continue to put out significant 
some of it final regulation on implementing the Affordable Care Act, as I think all of you in this room know, that it really is about the state and local, and in my case, local, tribal, territorial, for what I have in the Pacific, but it really is about state and local implementation. And so you cannot bypass the federal government, but just as important is being involved in the decisions at the state, local, and depending on what you do, tribal and territorial levels, as well as a part of that government. And we will sort of tease out all of that tonight. So the other point I'm going to make besides, one, this really is the time to control your own destiny. Two, federal framework, but state and local level implementation is the three major buckets of the Affordable Care Act. And those buckets, while everybody, I think, sort of nationally focused on the question that was before the Supreme Court, is the individual mandate constitutional? And a couple of others around the expansion of the Medicaid program, or in this state, the Medi-Cal program. The important thing is that we've been at work together, public, private, nonprofit sector, communities, implementing the Affordable Care Act since day one. So three major, if you will, legs of the stool. First is increasing access and the expansion of coverage. Up to 30 million people being covered by January 1, 2014, when the individual mandate goes into effect. Up to 30 million. And the Supreme Court actually upheld every provision of the Affordable Care Act. They did say that the expansion of Medicaid, which can come along with it, was voluntary, not mandatory, but they still upheld that that was a constitutional, if you will, ability to increase Medi-Cal at the option of states. It was not constitutional when it came to doing it at a mandatory level. So a public and private mixture expanding coverage to up to 30 million people. Second, consumer protections. And we could sort of go through all of them, and we probably will in some of our discussions. But you start to hear a lot of stats, or are living a lot of those stats, between 3.1 million young adults between 19 and 25 getting health care coverage, uh, 54 million Americans receiving at least one preventive health care service free of charge in 2014, senior citizens and um, disabled on Medicare, uh, millions of them, 5.3 million, benefiting in $3.9 billion worth of prescription drug, count, uh, drug uh, discounts because we know in the Affordable Care Act, no senior, no person with a disability should ever have to choose between food and medicine. And those are some of the things that we'll talk about in the consumer protections that are already well at play. So one, we've got increasing access and expansion of coverage. Two, we have consumer protections that are already in place for millions of Americans. And then three, and as important, is really what we talk about a lot, and I think what you do in the school, is really increasing quality and containing costs. And containing costs does not mean harming consumers. A lot of people sort of look at me and say, well, you can't, and I think Ben will beg to differ, and so will you and others, you can't increase quality and contain costs at the same time. Well, in effect, we're actually doing it through many of the delivery system reforms and interventions, whether they're for chronic disease and the focus on prevention or wellness, or what we're doing in the, if you will, accountable care world by incentivizing the delivery of coordinated, integrated care, primary care with specialty care, behavioral health incorporated and um, integrated with physical health. So that's the ACA in five minutes. It's <laughs> constitutional. It has three major legs, expanding access and coverage, consumer protections, increasing quality and containing costs. Now is the time to control your own destiny as individuals, as family members, as academics, as community members, and let's have at it. So, so now I get to ask some questions that, that might open up some avenues for us to explore a little bit more over this next 45 minutes or so. And, and since I said Mark was our, the chair of our advisory board, I get to ask the first question of him because I know he'll be ready for this. So, so as uh, Herb has touched on just briefly, 
clearly the funding dynamic is going to be changing from the standpoint of federal, state, local. You've got 181 members who are in a variety of uh, situations within their local areas. So how do you think that that change in the funding dynamic is likely to affect those types of institutions? So let me remind you what I said when you asked me to be on this panel for Accountable Care Act discussion. Mm -hmm. I said, we can talk about the Accountable Care Act, but all the other things that are happening that were spurred on by Accountable Care Act impact exactly what you say. So the private sector is moving forward and has been adapting to this change, adjusting. So we know reimbursement's going to change. We know it's going to go from fee-for-service, beds on heads in the traditional community hospital. They get paid to have patients stay in those beds up until a certain time, and they want them in those beds. The physicians get paid to order a lot of tests and to do a lot of things. That is changing now, and it's changing, spurred on by accountable care, but we're seeing a significant, drastic change in the entire model and the delivery and the payment. So hospitals, the 181, actually 184 members, are all grappling with how do we change from a fee-for-service, we're still getting paid fee-for-service by and large, or DRG or something like that, but we're gonna go to quality and we're going to go to from inpatient setting to an outpatient setting. And we're going to do this without stopping what we're doing now. So it's, it's like somebody said yesterday, it's, it's riding two horse or changing horse races in the middle of a race. But I think the better analogy, it's changing horses going in two opposite directions. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be very nimble. So hospitals and physicians, we're all going to struggle with the health plans as well. How do you do this without really crippling the system? Mm -hmm. And so the system's going to have to make some significant adjustments. And so we are looking at the various types. I mean, Kaiser, Ben is on our board and a member. They're positioned, I think, very nicely for this. Then we've got other hospitals, traditional teaching, or excuse me, traditional community hospitals that are really grappling. Because you can stand downstairs and really be within walking or at least biking distance of six or seven hospitals, all independent or owned by different systems. So there's no synergy there. They aren't a system. So what we're going to talk about tonight is the integration that's going to occur and that a lot of what's going, been done on an inpatient setting is going to move to outpatient and the hospitals and the health plans and the physicians are going to have to work much more closely together to make that happen with the federal government. So it's, it's, there's a lot happening and, and it was spurred on by Accountable Care Act. And I love the example of the six hospitals that are local may have very different uh, areas of focus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so consequently being able to come up with that kind of integration is going to be a real challenge. So Ben, you've you're dealing with uh, essentially a closed system, mm -hmm. but you're gonna, your organization is also going to have funding challenges as well because there are some changes well, think, that will affect I think the well. funding challenges are challenges that face the healthcare world in general, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know, in the last decade, the rise in, in healthcare costs is, was just totally unsustainable, over 100%, 120, 130% increases in, uh, in healthcare costs at the same time that you know, the, the, the CPI has been pretty flat. So I think um, that, that, that's a big driver for a lot of the, a lot of the um, desire to bundle, to bundle payment systems, to buy, try to focus in on, on quality um, as, as well as affordability. Um, I actually agree, I, I, I don't disagree actually. You, you thought I, I disagree with you about you know, the emphasis on quality being uh, much more uh, efficient. No, I thought you would agree. I, I definitely agree, for yeah, sure. No, I because, thought you would agree. And, and I'm not just sucking up to him because he's... <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but, but I He actually, did that when I was a state official. Yes, yeah, yeah. right. We needed, <laughs> we so needed things from him then. Uh, but but the, the issue is, um, when you actually look at um, the, the system that Mark talks about, where uh, it's, it's pretty much fee-for-service, episode care oriented, it's really point of time care when you mm -hmm. really think about it. And, and usually it's when people are sick or develop symptoms. And you know, most, mo most, most of us realize that so much of um, health is really about what you do before you get to that point and, and, um, and, and in those episodes. So I, I actually think that the focus on um, the larger picture, right, really the, the full continuum over a longer period of time is really going to be the, the, the answer for us. And it's something that we've been at it uh, for about 60 years at mm -hmm. Kaiser Permanente. Um, now the question is, why is, this, uh, why is this really going to happen? And I, I have to say that, in, in fact, you know, you know, there are a lot, we were talking earlier about the Clinton Health Plan in the, um, in, the, in the 90s, 
and you know, we had changes. We had a lot of uh, 10 years of uh, very, very modest cost increases. Everybody thought that managed care, particularly all of us on the East Coast, we were holding up our crosses and saying, no, 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 no managed care from California. To Mine was a Jewish star. Exactly right. It's the same thing. You get the point. Right? Yeah, so, I got it. But, uh, but the truth is that managed care in the, in the 90s, it was really not what we're talking about now. I mean, it, it, theoretically, everyone was talking about integrated care and vertical integration where hospitals and doctors, health plans all come together. Everybody worked for the, the benefit of the community and on, uh, for, on prevention and health. But um, the, the problem, of course, was that you know, most of managed care payments was still uh, fee-for-service, service. right? Most people took the capitated payment and, and still parceled it out on a fee-for-service basis. It was still episode of care oriented. And the, th the problem, of course, is that you couldn't even tell whether you were doing the right, the, 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 doing a good job. And, and I think the difference between the 90s and now, um, and I know it's very painful, we're implementing it across the country in a, in a very slow and methodical way, not less than methodical way, is information technology, right? I think that information technology, as well as the demand of, of uh, the public on transparency, mm -hmm. right? So, so right now, we can focus in on quality and on focus in on metrics uh, of quality, even though they may be, be a bit imperfect. But we can do that because we can actually measure it. You know, we can get better at measuring quality and, and, and we can do that largely because of computerization. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm an internist by training, and I have to tell you, when I was practicing, I couldn't even tell you how many people I took care of, right? I, how many people are in my panel, let alone, you know, what kind of illnesses they had. I could tell you in general terms, but I couldn't tell you how many people had diabetes or hypertension. And if you asked me, how are they doing, I couldn't really tell you, because there was no real way to do real-time um, real-time uh, analysis of all of my patients uh, at any point in time. So, 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 so I, all I could do was wait until they came in, you know, either for a, a, a um, scheduled visit or when they were sick and try to address as many things as possible, right? So that, that's, that, was, that was then. Now, at least, we're capable of tracking the entire population. Not that everybody has that ability yet, but you know, doctors are moving very fast. Two-thirds of doctors now have some form of electronic health records. I think the hospitals have been slow, but they're going to get there. And, and the key is, um, can, can we configure these tools so that we can take a, get a glimpse of a population that we serve? And that's something that we've been doing at Kaiser Permanente. So, you know, the, the fun part about being uh, where we are is that, you know, we can hold a mirror on performance. I mean, 3.6 million people. I can tell you I have 600,000 people with hypertension. I can also tell you that 86% of them have a record of being controlled. And I can tell you who, who, who isn't controlled so that we can actually figure out how to configure the system to go after the people that really have the gaps in care. Um, and, and as a result of that, I think we, you know, we're going to see marked increases in quality, moving the, the, the curve way upstream so that we can try to impact the people before they actually get that congestive heart failure, the heart attacks and the strokes. How does the act encourage that kind of a focus? And are there some experiments that are going on uh, around the country that you think uh, would really be worthwhile for us to think about uh, within the California environment? Well, I, I think there are huge experiments going on. Um, uh, many of you may know that there actually is an innovation fund uh, within the ACA. It's within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It's a $10 billion innovation fund. And this is where you sometimes hear, well, I'll just say the sort of misinformation that comes sort of across the coast because a significant part of the ACA is what I call sort of bought and paid for. It's authorized and appropriated. And so the $10 billion in the Innovation Center is appropriated. It basically was set up for two things. One, to look at innovations in service delivery. And the other is to look at the innovations in payment in Medicare, in Medicaid, and in the Children's Health Insurance Program. But obviously, usually those take root and usually then push the private sector. Sometimes it's the private sector sort of pushing. 
Um, but there are a couple of um, pilots, I guess I could probably, and, and demonstration programs that I can talk about. The biggest that I think most people know about are accountable care organizations, ACOs. And it sort of is the catchphrase and what a lot of people talk about. But at its core, it's about having providers in a coordinated, integrated system managing the care of, at this point, Medicare beneficiaries, seniors and people with disabilities, primary care, preventive care, primary care, and specialty care. And one thing that has happened with that is, I mean, I think Kaiser and a number of other, quite frankly, integrated medical groups in uh, California and in this area were some of the, if you will, sort of models for that. But the ACOs are not full-blown managed care, and that's what a lot of people in California will say they don't think that it's exactly everything it needs to be. But outside of California, outside of Minnesota, and outside of a couple other places, most of this country really doesn't know full capitated managed care. And so it was put in there by Congress to be able to, if you will, sort of start to bring people down the track of understanding and getting into a system that is coordinated and integrated. So the ACOs are one. Most of them right now have been hospitals and physicians together. They're actually governed, and you have to have a majority of physicians, if you will, sort of in the governing body. But you also can have uh, a group of individual physicians networked together. You can actually now have federally qualified health centers, some rural health centers that do that. Um, and a couple of other models. And so that is one of sort of the biggest pieces that is there. And, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And so the initial program, if you will, was sort of a, a it's, it's fee for service, but it's coordinated. But a lot of, led by California, who knows coordinated integrated care with full capitation and a closed network, or rural California that said, to us and to others, rural parts of my region in Arizona and in, in Nevada and in Hawaii were basically saying, well, we're small. We don't have the infrastructure, the IT systems. You know, We don't have what you have been able to successfully do with billions of dollars to integrate the system. So we came out with, through the Innovation Center, there's the main ACO program, but there's a pioneer ACO program for people that have done it. A third of those nationally are in California. And then there's also an advanced payment model, which is going to a lot of places. So that's one really big place. The other one, I think I'll give you an example, because I've had a lot of, 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 of people talking with me about it, is you know, patient safety is a significant issue. It's not there aren't, and that we don't have the greatest healthcare providers, hospitals, doctors, nurses, and the like, and allied professionals. You know, as the IOM said in 1999, to err is human. And we still, because of the fee-for-service, non-integrated system that we've had in the most of the country, you know, still kill about 100,000 people a year and significantly maim millions of others. And you can talk about productivity. You can talk about all the things that that contributes to. And so for the first time in this sort of, you know, the way we do Medicare, we're basically saying, you know, on um, issues like readmissions within 30 days, starting on October 1st, if you're sort of below the average line, you'll get dinged a percent. You'll, you'll lose as a hospital system. It'll eventually happen in nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities and, and hospices and other places. We're also doing something very similar with um, healthcare acquired infections, starting with the hospitals, but it's not the only place to be. Well, what are we doing with that? We now are actually starting a value-based purchasing program October 1, so with the money from those that are getting dinged up to 1%, we're providing $850 million, billion dollars, excuse me, in incentives across the country on um, uh, $850 million, uh, across the country for systems that are actually doing great work. And so again, service delivery and payment. So it can be um, patient safety, it can be bundling, in other words, sort of putting all of the costs, if you will, sort of all of it into one payment, 
and then sort of having a primary source doling out these issues around accountable care organizations. And there's many, many right. more yeah, that are in there. Absolutely. So, so Mark, I, perhaps you can talk a little bit. I realize mm -hmm. it's very difficult to try to generalize around 184 member institutions, but are there some innovative things that you think are going on within your members that are really worthwhile looking at? Yes, yeah, so as, we, as I said earlier, what's happening though is that the, the things that Herb just outlined in terms of readmissions and value-based purchasing are changing incentives and then hence changing behavior, changing the way th hospitals are doing things and working with physicians. Um, for an example, my dad uh, was very sick about five years ago and he was bouncing in and out of the hospital and one day, he was, about a week after he was there, he was told to go to his physician for a follow-up appointment. So he went to see the physician, his home care worker was helping him in and out of the house. He was coming up the stairs, fell, broke a rib, so he had to go back to the hospital a week after, he, so that was a readmission. So um, things have changed so much. My mom's in the same medical group, same plan, same physician, and she had a hospitalization recently. But she, and so once she went home, her primary care, same primary care physician, assigned her to a home physician. So she doesn't have to leave the house again. So it is changing behavior and the system for the best. So we're seeing this occur, mm -hmm. and we're seeing this occur in all the, the, the settings. Mm -hmm. Some are better positioned to do this and more integrated with physicians. So that's where we need to see the change happen. And you're seeing it occur in the region, or especially Southern California, because I mentioned you have those hospitals right around here that are all owned by separate companies. You're gonna see more affiliations, more mergers, more consolidation, and we believe eventually more closures, because we do, we have an excess capacity of inpatient beds here. So as we move more to an ambulatory setting, they're not gonna need as many beds. So we will see some of that, but we're, we're seeing alliances now down in Orange County, you saw Hogue and St. Joseph's system affiliate. So you got a, Provident, or a Presbyterian and a Catholic system coming together. In the Valley, you had Facy Medical Group and uh, uh, Providence merge. So you're seeing this across the region to do that, to, to better coordinate the care and the quality that, that's being delivered at our hospitals. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I make one point Absolutely. onto that? Um, and so take the operation side and think about the policy side and what I talked about a little while ago about controlling your own destiny. Mm -hmm. The greatest thing about the position that I have, it used to be a public affairs job in every other administration, Democrat and Republican. And, you know, I've been a lobbyist for a long time. I've done operations. I love public affairs. But I did not want to have a job that just sort of was like, hi, this is what we think, and then next, and never see folks again. And so you have a president as a community organizer, secretary who was a governor who put in place presidential appointees <laughs> for one specific reason, and that is we know that we cannot be successful in the implementation if we're not working not only with federal, state, local, tribal, territorial officials, but with key non-governmental external stakeholders. And so on a 24-7 basis, I'm not the regulator. So I'm not, you know, I'm not CMS. The head of CMS in the region sits on my management council, so I can talk with stakeholders 24-7 about regulatory proposals. And so that's going to be an open invitation to you, and I'll give out my email and cell phone later. That's an open invitation yes. to this happens mm -hmm. because we're going to organizations and saying, okay, we can't do this on our own. What do you think about this potential issue before we come out with a proposed rulemaking, before we come out with a final rulemaking? It won't always, we won't always agree with you but that's the difference in this administration as to how it plays out in the policy realm and then in the implementation realm as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this whole issue about accelerated consolidations is something that is, again, starting on the West Coast. It, it, it strikes me that, that I think the relationships that we have within the systems in, especially California, make it likely that you're going to start to see those kinds of consolidations very rapidly, some of the ones that, that Mark was talking about. So how do you think that's going to affect kind of the whole lay of the land yeah. around um, insurance within California. Well, you know, there's been a, a tremendous amount of well, in, uh, consolidation in the insurance world, too. Mm -hmm. There's really only a handful of dominant ones, and they're buying each other out, out right now. And physician groups, they're and buying phys physician yes, groups right. as well. Waiting for one to buy a hospital. They haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. hospitals are buying well, physician groups. Yeah. <laughs> I know that 
some of them have to close. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. I, I, I do think that there are actually some partnerships across the country where Aetna, for example, have, yes. have uh, entered into really strategic agreements with dominant mm -hmm. hospital systems that have physician groups attached to it as well, mm -hmm. the Carillion system and a few others. Um, and there, really, I, if I were a, a health plan, not Kaiser, a, a different health plan, I would actually look to do that as well. You know, the, in the 90s, you know, we had health plans pitted against the hospitals <laughs> and the doctors, and everyone was sort of trying to jockey for a dominant position, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, um, and I, I think that the winners are not going to do that, they, because they can't. I don't think any single sector can dominate the other at this point. The hospitals really need the doctors. The, the, and, and really, the hospitals and the doctors don't have the, the really don't have the, the uh, capacity to manage care without uh, multiple payers, actually, at least contributing enough uh, information so that you actually can see how well you're doing with that population, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're still, you know, we're evolving from a very fragmented, um, health system to a slightly less fragmented one. I, and I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with all these mergers and acquisitions. Some of them obviously will fail and some of them will work. Uh, the cultures are really amazing things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to have to deal with. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I think that there's also the possibility that people will really cooperate. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the patient safety realm, you know, Mark, Mark knows this uh, very well that a lot of the hospitals have gotten together in uh, hospital engagement networks, something funded by the, the federal government to focus in on, on uh, how we collectively as an industry can work on uh, making things safer for, for our members. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think the, um, it wasn't the secretary, it was, it was uh, ARC that just announced a 40% decline in uh, in uh, bloodstream infections over a very short period yeah. of time, which is a very short period of time. So, so you know that these things can work. And that's something else that's different from the 90s, is that hospitals back then, and I was just getting started, and by the way, for those of you that are coming out of school or getting into the healthcare policy right now, you couldn't have picked a more exciting time to do it. Because <laughs> this, this reminds me of when I started. But in the 90s, what I can't re remember is the collaboration that's occurring now and has been occurring uh, for quite some time. Hospitals are willing to share information about what they're doing right to help patients recover faster or to keep them safe. So we have a patient safety collaborative that Anthem has actually funded for going on four years now through the state. And we've got over 100 hospitals in our region participating. You've got competitors who sit at the table and say, here's what we're doing to help patients improve. And so that's something that I think, I'm not sure if it was happening in the 90s. I, I know it wasn't happening to the degree we didn't have the data that we have now. I, yeah, I will, I will not ask any of you that are students now whether you were born uh, after <laughs> 1988, but what, what one of my mentors, Dr. Judy Fader, many of you know her, and uh, mm -hmm. she was my health policy professor. In the spring of 1988, Judy and Jack Scanlon co-taught a, a course on public health policy. And that's, I just knew I sort of wanted health or education and that sort of sealed it for me for those of you that know Judy. And the last class, the 15th class, was on quote unquote alternative delivery systems <laughs> and the entire lecture was on what is a Blue Cross Blue Shield sort of al alternative plan. We've come a huge, you know, that's like tw now 25 years. We have come a huge way for that. And so I want to echo that because you couldn't have planned it any better. I know I couldn't have planned when I was fighting for 15 months for this job that we'd be in the midst of health reform implementation. Great. So I promise you that we're going to get an opportunity to have questions from the group, but I get one last question. And so be thinking about the questions you want to ask. So one of the areas that we haven't touched on, although Herb teed it up very nicely, is there are a number of cost-saving provisions within the Act. Um, I think that there are a number of us that have been involved in the field for a long time who are skeptical about whether or not we actually will see the kinds of cost savings that are anticipated. Panelists, what's your sense about the, the way that cost is going to be affected through uh, the, the Affordable Care Act? Well, of course, the, 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 the hope is that costs will come down because of better coordination of care, getting better outcomes for, for members, really getting the, the, the waste out of the system, 
And uh, not only that, but getting the adverse outcomes out of the system. So it really, it, there is savings from not having bloodstream infections or urinary tract infections complicating the course. And of course, readmissions is a big deal. You know, when you think about the Medicare population, and I think it's 22% of the Medicare population after their discharge are readmitted within 30 days. And that's a huge chunk. One out of five discharges come back to the hospital. If we can figure out ways to do, to keep people uh, well during that period of time, prevent that hospitalization, there's going to be some savings. And of course, the, the provision, the, you know, um, there are no other provisions that on the health plan side, we're a Medicare Advantage plan, mm -hmm. and, um, and there is a ratcheting down of Medicare Advantage right. premiums, which is um, not always easy to contend with when it happens so quickly, mm -hmm. but, but it, um, probably it's, it's a valid, uh, you know, valid um, move. And then, of course, we have the infamous IPAP, right, the Independent Payment Advisory Board that sets a GDP plus one target for Medicare expenditures and, and of course, comes up with a set of plan, a set of options that Congress either has to vote up or down. If they don't do their job. If they don't, which, <laughs> you know, you, how much have, you want to bet on that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, at least there's a, there's a piece of that in there. And, and I think that the last two years, um, and, and this happened in the 90s, right, that we saw healthcare inflation come down. Uh, and healthcare inflation over the last couple of years, of course, we were in post in a recession or post re post recession recovery, mm -hmm. but it's been hovering around uh, four percent per year, uh, and that's a, a marked improvement from you know the high high singles and double digit inflations that we saw for most of the prevailing decade. Right. So I'll mention uh, um, I'll mention a couple more, um, and then I'm interested in, in in what you have as well, but. I think there is a lot there uh, in terms of uh, cost effectiveness and cost savings. We believe obviously there's a lot more that can be done and over these years of implementation, we think there'll be other things that will start to get put into place um, as well. Some of the demonstrations like on bundling and other things that can have that impact. But let me mention too, the focus on prevention and wellness. There is a $10 billion public health and prevention fund. Um, but one thing that sort of is not in the public's consciousness yet is in addition to the free preventive services for major, you know, cancer screenings and other things that are out there, um, there is, uh, uh, there are um, uh, individual incentives, 30% that could be up to 50% for works like wellness programs that could take those dollars off of, of premiums, up to 50% off premiums. They're community-based with community transformation grants and the social determinants of health. And then I mentioned that there's the worksite wellness pieces that are all of there. The other thing is in the, if you will, the essential benefits for individuals and small businesses across the country, those essential benefits have to have what's now known as a prevention, wellness, and chronic disease management benefit. California and others are trying to define what that means but we are taking a sickness system and taking it out to a system hopefully based on wellness. That's not an overnight transition. It's easier, I think, to see, as Ben was talking about the other one, was health information technology. It's easier to see, I think, at a different level, the fraud, waste, and abuse stuff that, that's happening, to see those things that are, that are happening. But we have started to see, you know, not only less uninsured, but for 2012, we haven't made the announcement for 2013, but the Part B premium, the physician premium in Medicare went down $22 in 2012. And that was in no small part due to, I mean, some of it, it included the ratcheting down of, of MedAdvantage, but sort of all of these pieces. So there are significant parts of the law. Um, one other, I guess I should mention, is that um, everybody should be thinking about, when you think about tax day, April 15th, think about rebate day, August 1, because um, there's the 80-20 or 85-15 rule, 80 cents on the dollar going to medical care and benefit, and 15 to 20 on administration and profit. Well, $1.1 billion in the first year went to um, you know, consumers across the country. There was a study that was done that said if it would happened on day one, it would have been $2 billion. 
So there are those changes that are starting to work their way through. An average of $65 a, a person in California may not be a lot, but over the country, $1.1 billion uh, is a lot. So those are some. Mark? So we know what the federal government spending in healthcare is not sustainable. We can't survive as a, as a country with that model. So we know Medicare reimbursement is going to need to be cut. Mm -hmm. And the hospitals are obviously a large portion of that. So the hospitals are preparing to do what they need to do on less. So in order to get there, they're going to have to reduce costs. And that's not just, you can't just let staff go. You need the staff to take care of the patients that are there. But you can, you can drive efficiencies. But we also have to make sure the incentives are aligned. And th that goes back to my opening comments about how hospitals are paid now doesn't, and how the physicians are paid do this. So that doesn't, that doesn't drive uh, efficiencies within the system. The right test should be ordered at the right time and the patient should be in the right hospital for the right length of time until they need to go home. And once they go home, they should have the right care on the post-acute side. So again, that goes back to my opening comments about the transition we're in, which is a real challenge. So for example, one way that the state and the federal government's going to reduce cost is by putting the patients or the individuals that qualify for Medi-Cal or Medicaid and Medicare into managed care. So that's the dual eligibles. They'll be going into Medi-Cal managed care in uh, demonstration projects or uh, demonstration uh, pilots. In under review. Under review, yes. Eventually, <laughs> sometime, because we all know it makes sense. It's the right thing to do for the patients, but you have to make sure the systems, the delivery systems are in place to care for, it's a very uh, in, uh, service intense, they, they need a lot of services and consume a lot of resources when they get into the, the hospital. And, and so if you're gonna do that on a managed care, which is the right thing to do for the patients, you're gonna have to make sure that the delivery model's there. So what I'm trying, but for example, the way one hospital now is structured and the care they deliver to uh, the, the dual population when it moves to managed care, it's going to cost that hospital $240 million. I mean, they're going to lose $240 million in revenue. So that has other consequences downstream. So you need to make sure you've got the entire delivery system able to um, sustain itself while we're making these changes. So it's the right thing to do, but you just, we just have to make sure that it's, that it's being done correctly with, no, with as few unintended consequences as possible. But we, we need to drive the costs down significantly. Great. Okay, so we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time for your questions. Uh, we've only touched on a few of the, the main areas that this particular act addresses. What's on your mind? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, my husband's in the film industry, he's a sound mixer. And when you make a movie, there's two, two groups of people. There are people above the line, which are the actors, the directors, the producers, you know, the, the ones who get all the residuals. And then there's the below the line people, which are the gaffer, the grip, the sound mixer, which my husband was, the, the craft service person. You can't make the movie without the both the below the line and above the line people. Mm -hmm. um, everything I've heard tonight and my concern about the Affordable Care Act is it's very focused on above the line care. Hospitals, payers, and physicians. And how that's organized and how it's paid and how it's bundled and all this thing. And, and so the consolidation of hospitals is a perfect example in Los Angeles you have a lots of hospitals close together, and then we have an area called Spa 6 that has no hospitals in it. So when you talk about below the line, of which I've been in healthcare for 33 years, I've worked for you guys, <laughs> I was in healthcare management, I went back and got my PhD, I've been an NIH researcher, and now I'm an advocate for the parts of our city that have no healthcare provision in it. I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to provide and get health professionals to go into Spa 6. There's not a dental chair. I haven't heard you talk about dentists. I haven't heard you talk about social workers, rehabilitation specialists. 
Um, healthcare that a family needs is more than a physician, a hospital, and insurance. I, I actually briefly mentioned the social determinants of health and, and the reason for that. And I would disagree with you in terms of the focus when you talk about the delivery system because we haven't gotten a chance yet to talk about um, what the new marketplace is for individuals and for small businesses means, what the Medi-Cal expansion means for those folks, what frankly it means for care that is unaffordable where catastrophic plans can be offered. And so I, I, I understand exactly where you are. We haven't talked about the workforce provisions that are building not just you know physicians. It takes a long time to build a physician, but we're talking about nurse practitioners, nurses, physician's assistants, school-based clinics, nurse-managed clinics, um, uh, and several sort of other things that are there. And so um, I don't think that in the opening comments, at least, that we've had meant to exclude sort of the individual person and sort of how that does that. We also haven't talked about, if you're just above that line, advanceable tax credits that will bring the cost of insurance significantly down. Very different thing than the workforce issues or the facilities that are going to need to be there to that. But I just wanted to sort of mention on the individual side, I could spend an hour and sort of walk you through every provision sure, that is that. there. Yep, no, I would, I would. Yeah, no, I think actually that you make a very good yep. point. And, and it's not just about the delivery system, right? It's not just about, because, uh, in, and mm -hmm. I think Herb alluded to that, that moving upstream and really making an impact on the health of a community is a lot more than just about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the health care delivery system. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that there, you know, if you actually look at the provisions that are in the Affordable Care Act, as well as the, uh, the Recovery Act before that, there's a lot of money that's being plowed into expansion of capabilities for SPA 6. You know, and I, and Martin Luther King is getting rebuilt. Yeah. It's supposed to be open soon. Uh, so and it's the edge of SPA, SPA 6, I understand that. And, and I do think that, but, but the, the Medicaid expansion should actually bring some dollars into the, the area and, and pull some, uh, uh, some people in. And, the, it, and in the um, Recovery Act, there was quite a bit of money that hasn't actually been utilized completely, but uh, for expansion of federally qualified health centers, right? And, and, that, and the federally qualified health centers, if they're done right, are not just about getting doctors and dentists and other people in there. It's about pulling a whole team uh, in there. Uh, I, I personally think that the, um, for, for areas like SPA 6, as well as uh, a lot of rural areas, you're ne never going to get the, the, the numbers of healthcare professionals to come in as, uh, as the, the, the models predict, right? right. So it's going to have to be teams of other people armed really with data, I, I, quite frankly. You have to know how, what the health of the population is before you can target interventions. And it, it doesn't, you, don't, you don't really need doctors to do it all at this point. You know, as a matter of fact, the, prim the primary care uh, medical home movement is, n is not as much about primary care doctors. It's about an entire team mm -hmm. focusing in on what the gaps are in the, in the, in the health of the population and addressing uh, different interventions uh, to, to, to get there. The, the, the entire state of Vermont is actually uh, moving towards a community-based model to try to take information from a registry that will be managed uh, statewide and targeting various uh, community-based interventions to try to get people to have uh, to get control of their their chronic illnesses, as well as uh, address some of the health needs. So we're just at the edge of that at this point in in, in the in the implementation. But embedded in uh, in the whatever it is, 1,200 or 1,300 pages, there are a lot of provisions that try to push the health system to get to that that that, that level. And, and unfortunately, in California, and this is, so we're dealing with federal, and you talked about it's federal, state, and local. We're dealing with a state government that is, I guess, strained as an understatement, uh, significant budget crisis. 
And the Medi-Cal program in California is the lowest rate of reimbursement for physicians and hospitals in the country. So what they get paid compared to what they get in other states makes it difficult to support that infrastructure, as you say. So it's, it's, and, but now on the outpatient and the ambulatory, as we do more in that setting and away from the physicians to address the disparities, and I think the, the system needs to change so we look at it more globally, so it's not just Medi-Cal or medic so it becomes more managed through all sectors. Cal California is one of the five states that have done Medicaid expansion early. California through the low income health program, uh, LA County is, is half of that, but it has been a huge success and has exceeded everybody's expectations. In a little bit over a year, there are more than 400,000 low income childless adults um, throughout the entire state and almost every county that have been, that have come into this program. That's a very big thing. We just did a thing at THE Clinic, but there were um, uh, 12 uh, organizations, federally qualified health centers in LA County, let alone the rest of the state, that received part of the $11 billion in expansion in the health center. So I'm glad, Ben, that you raised that. And we'll see Medi-Cal Managed Care expand. And I saw uh, Walter Zellman, Dr. Zellman here, who's chair of the LA Care Health Plan Board. And so that, that, that's, that's another opportunity to start resolving some of these disparity issues. Great question. Yes? Uh, a question is a physician and is a, is a client of the system. Uh, you talk about 35 million people uh, to be enrolled in Medicare, Medicaid situation. So who is going to take not, care of this? Uh, not, not Medicare, Medicaid. Med it's Medicaid. up to 30. It's private and public. But who is going to take care of these people? Uh, my kid had to wait uh, four months to see an endocrinologist, and they work in the system. Uh, me, I have to wait a pen seven months to see a neurologist. So who's going to take care of these people? And the second question is, uh, I have nurses working with me, and the Medi-Cal pays me $40,000 a year to, for the services provided by a nurse, uh, who costs me $120,000 a year. So how? How can I do it? Uh, the, the numbers don't add up. Well, let me say two things. One is, is we alluded to, it, the workforce is a very, very tough issue. It's not going to happen overnight. There's more than a billion dollars worth of programs in the ACA. Um, most of the programs that I had seen before were all sort of nursing programs. And they are greatly expanded across the board to educate and to train um, many different levels, including going from community health workers to physicians to many allied professionals that are in between. But that's why some of those programs around school-based clinics, nurse-managed clinics, the uh, FQHCs, PAs, and PEs, because it takes longer to do that. But we know but not everybody's going to come into the system and need to use a physician moment one. The issue around sort of waiting and, and sort of those issues are, it is a real issue. And I think it's going to continue to be an issue, but with coordinated and integrated care, I think, over time. I mean, we hear a lot of people talk about the benefits of other countries and what they do. We understand here, if people have to wait more than four weeks, it is an extraordinary strain. The other thing I would say on sort of your other point is that starting January 1, uh, 2013, for 2013 and 2014, for um, um, primary care services in Medicaid, the Medicaid rate will equal the Medicare rate. So in, in California, that's an average of about 56 cents in Medicaid, a dollar on Medicare. And so the federal government will be paying in California that 44 cents. So that's $11 billion over two years that's going out to primary care mm -hmm. physicians, NPs, PAs, um, that I have talked with a lot of physicians across the state, NPs, who have left or did not take Medi-Cal, who have said that may be something that they come in to do. We don't set the state Medi-Cal rates. That's a whole process. But what I think the ACA did in Medicare, actually, as well, and Medicaid, is recognize that there was significant were significant problem in access 
because of the payment rates. And so that's part of why the ACA is, is increasing uh, those payments. And we, we have a draft rule that's out. And one of the things we did is we hear all the time about so much of this is focused on primary care. And I think we all know the reasons why the specialists have issues. But we've said, for example, in the draft rule, if it's a pediatric cardiology case, I think some people would argue and say that's not primary care. We've said that's primary care because it starts with the pediatrician and therefore they will get the increase in reimbursement as well. So I'll give you my information later. I'd love to be able to sort of talk with you further. I want to make sure we get some folks in the back. Um, great. No relation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear her. So anyway, I'm... I teach nursing informatics and nursing, nursing administration at Cal State Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And my question is for you know, Dr. Schultz and any, any of the others about the wisdom, lack thereof perhaps, of using patient satisfaction as a measure upon which hospitals are reimbursed. Um, for those of you who are not and maybe didn't ever s stop as a, as a clinician or provider, it's this. It's not a clean measure the way that certain measures of mortality, like AMI mortality, is or are. Or maybe complication rates of hospitals are meaningful points of comparison between them. But patient satisfaction has unmeasured um, severity of illness. It has unmeasured undiagnosed um, anxiety, unrelieved pain environmental factors like the noise, the parking that isn't so good, the hospital lighting, which sometimes is about as good as what's in this room. We can't even see the patient. I mean, there are other factors that are involved in patient satisfaction. And I'm in the group that says, and although we don't hope that people are unhappy or dissatisfied, we know that they will be, particularly when they are measured in a snapshot. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering uh, where you see that going. Because everybody gets paid for performance otherwise. Thank I, I you. I think that actually it's making its way in. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of talk about being patient-centered, and it's not just about patient satisfaction. Uh, you know, as a measure of pa patient-centeredness, it's it's actually a lot more than that. But but I, you know, if you actually look at what's happening in healthcare, there's there's really a, a, a movement towards really trying to understand what the voice of the patients and the family members are. You know, we're doing a lot of video ethnography, you know, really interviewing people about their experiences and um, trying to understand, you know, what, what works for, for, for our, our members and what doesn't work for our members. Um, and, uh, and, you, and by the way, it's actually making its way in the re into the reimbursement system, I mean, in a very indirect way. You know, in the Medicare Advantage uh, program, there, there's a rating of health plans uh, who offer Medicare Advantage. It's a five-star rating. And I have to, have, I have to, this is an infomercial. Kaiser is the only plan that has five star. Uh, but part of the measures in the five star is, is actually patient satisfaction in the hospitals. Um, and so that's just one, you know, it's one example. But I, I think you're going to begin to see more and more and more. Um, the, the American Hospital Association, one of the things that we're looking at now is, uh, is uh, patient engagement and patient, uh, and, and getting the patient's voice into um, the care delivery system. Um, and and it's, it's really exploding. You know, Don Berwick, of course, made it, uh, you know, really uh, pounded it home because Don, you know, you, most of you know who Don Berwick is, is really a patient-centered uh, uh, person advocate, right? So he's just been uh, out there talking about the triple aim and the care experience is one major piece of it. Um, and I actually think that uh, everybody's beginning to get it at this point. Now, obviously, it would be great to have more of the incentives in the payment system, um, you know, streamed through, you know, of, uh, measures of, of uh, satisfaction and patient-centeredness. We have to get a little better at measuring that before we can do that. But it is, in fact, uh, where, where the, we're all going at this point. And so it may not be, as you just said, perfect measures, but it is, it is providing enough incentive that I'm seeing it with our members become much more competitive on patient satisfaction. And really, as you said, catering to the patient, which is a, a much different than it was 15 years ago, 10 years ago. 
So giving, I mean, Disney's now has a, a track for hospitals in healthcare for the Disney experience. So you'll see more and more hospitals looking to completely revamp their patient experience, patient setting. You're, we're moving all away from the, uh, the double rooms to individual rooms. And they've got some very nice rooms at some of the, the, the hospitals here because they want to cater to the, the, the patient experience. And I believe, and I'm not a clinician, it, it's got to help with the recovery. Yeah, I mean, it's not just the physical plant. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in mm -hmm. building beautiful physical plants because I, do, I actually think there's a, a therapeutic environment that mm -hmm. you can create. But it's really about listening a lot mm -hmm. more, listening to what your patients need, what they're, you know. And, and actually, if you ever do a time and motion study, I'm sure we, we, we have relatives that we follow through or maybe we've been patients on our own trying to navigate the healthcare system. It's not pretty. It's actually <laughs> not pretty. <laughs> You know, and I, 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 can't, I challenge anyone to follow a patient around in the typical uh, world of healthcare. And you'll see that um, there is a lot that we can learn by just watching and listening and trying to experience the, what the, through the eyes of our, our patients. And that, that helps patient experience and it also helps efficiency. So as you track these patients around, if you make where they, how they flow through the facility much more uh, eff efficient, the patient appreciates that more. And again, I, going back to my family's experience, I'm walking back and forth and trying to find where my dad was for the tests, and he was moved over here, and then he went over there. It's, so it's, it's becoming much more patient-centered, as you said, which is a good thing for us. Great. Do we have a question back over here? I think what's been fascinating about it is exactly where you went because I've sat with many, um, you know, sort of um, physician leaders and hospital leaders that normally would not be sitting in the same room mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. That, to you know, two years ago, we're starting these conversations even without knowing what our ACO regulations were going to be like. And I mean, I sat in a room with, um, you know, two systems and, um, you know, um, prominent physicians and labor and all these folks. I think the thing that's been interesting to me is trying to, I've been talking with lots of individual physicians um, and trying to encourage them because many of them were on the forefront of saying, I don't want managed care running my life. I don't want this pill counter, you know, doing that. I want as a physician to do that. But interestingly enough, a lot of the individual physicians are, we're not trained to manage quality in care. Mm -hmm. And so, at least right now, and I don't know if that's the reason for it especially, but right now, most of the ACOs are hospitals and physicians, and yeah, there's lots of barriers, but they're actually coming together. Right? Yeah, yeah I'd, like, I'd actually like to comment on that as well. One of the programs that I teach in involves physicians from all over the country. And uh, very early on, what became clear is that the Affordable Care Act got physicians and hospitals talking about some of these issues faster than anything that I had ever seen in my 25 years within the healthcare delivery system. And it spurred health plans to buy physician groups. I mean, so it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's happening. So the ACOs are developing, it's, but it's, there's no easy way to but, do but it. But the other thing I think is that's really important, and I tried to make this point earlier, is that we're in an unprecedented era where 
we actually can monitor and track yes. these metrics of, of better outcomes of patient satisfaction. And you know, in a, in a world that demands transparency, right? Um, you know, believe it or not, when you hold that mirror up to doctors <coughs> and hospitals, you know, you, first of all, you get really embarrassed about the, the results, and then people actually start to come together and want to do something about it. It, it, uh, it just, you just can't avoid it, right? And the other thing we can't forget is I know that we're focusing on some of the industry issues today, but there are extraordinary opportunities in the ACA for grants and programs for community-based organizations, for nonprofits, for faith-based organizations, and it all sort of links. As a matter of fact, the main sort of care transitions program, you know, to try and better enable um, people to not have to get readmitted into the hospital. You can't, we're not, you, a hospital organization is not eligible for that grant unless they are affiliated with at least one community-based organization to do that. So I just want to say there, there is as much, I think, going on in that world to try and, that's where I sort of say, you know, knock, 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 where are the social determinants of health? Because we can talk all we want about access to health care. Um, I came out here 13 and a half years ago to be head of government affairs for AIDS Project Los, An Los Angeles. Yesterday was my 21st year of, of having tested positive. And I can tell you that the work that it, we did at APLA is that if we weren't talking with somebody who was homeless and worrying about the roof over their head and the housing opportunity of people with the AIDS program, right? They weren't going to be thinking about health care. If we didn't give them a bus token, right, to get to a physician, all the amount of social services we were doing, but if they couldn't get to the LA Gay and Lesbian Center or THE clinic or somewhere where there was a provider, they wouldn't do that. So the, the CBO piece is, is critical on delivery system reform because that's uh, another uh, part of our system. Absolutely. So we've got time for one more question. Who wants to fight for the microphone around that one? Yes. Good afternoon. Good evening, I would say. Jean-Vierre I'm very involved in healthcare for quite some time. And I think one of the issues is many patients do not know how to access quality of care. And I think when you do a lot of the survey, it's why some of the hospitals where I will not take my dog to be taken care of get top rating. And I think it's what you have to educate the patient on that issue. And most of the time, it's frivolous thing they identify with. I was director of nurses in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. That's bad enough, you know, you face today there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I had the largest prenatal care in the area, and we covered three states. Our own helicopter to pick up neonate and so on. But we could not get any of those regular delivery. So I went, I went to interview everybody I could find out where the baby recently, and I said, how come you didn't select our hospital? But you went to the competitor. Because they were giving steak and champagne. <laughs> And uh, very often, when you find issue of care, that's what they're lo looking at. You know, recently, I had my daughter in a hospital here in California. The care was so bad, and they even know who I was, so that was pretty stupid at top of that. But it's very difficult, and we have to do a lot of, of uh, education. And I think we have a long way to go, mm -hmm. both from the physi you know, physician part, I recently went to a huge conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where all the dean of the medical school were how to reform, you know, medical school setting. And, you know, a lot of things need to be really changed if we want to be up to cope with what's going on. And so we're not doing it. So how are we, we going to resolve that? I think um, Ben mentioned earlier that transparency, is, it's not happening fast enough, but it, it it is, get, we're getting to that point where there's a lot more information that the patients can make informed decisions. They still may go because of the steak and champagne, who knows. Right. Yeah, and I, this is also one of those that I look back more years than I care to think about as well because in one of my past lives, I was executive director of a health planning agency that put out the very first physician-specific fee guide. So we, ex we actually showed what Dr. Brown charged for an appendectomy, what Dr. Green did. Well, that was 1982. So 
We've got a long ways to go before we've got transparency around cost, transparency around quality, transparency Service. around services. Um, but but we've certainly made great strides right. in a relatively short period and of time. On, on the you know on the um, you know private side, I mean we are building the marketplace. People know about it as it exchanges for individuals and small businesses under 50. We already have finalized. I know that it's some issues with the health plans, but. We've already finalized the four-page document that is a summary of sort of all the benefits from each plan that people will have to get. I mean, there's, there's a degree of transparency and a degree of, of, you know, focus group work and stuff that's going on. But I agree with you, Genevieve, that it's going to be gradual, and I don't know that it's all in our lifetimes. I mean, you just can't sort of go like that. Um, if I can do one thing, I apologize. I have a... Uh, flight out of LAX, and if I don't go, I'm going to miss it. But you know how everybody, how many of you at work like take out your Blackberries and you have someone you work for that says, put that Blackberry away? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. How many of you use Blackberries and Blueberries and Crackberries? Okay. Okay. Take them out for a second. I'm serious. Take them out for a second. For those of you that. iPhones, oh, any sure. sort of device. Anybody who doesn't already have his phone number in there, that's what he's trying to do. I'm yeah. trying to give you the email <laughs> and the phone number. No, I'll leave some cards as, well, as well. Yeah. But Genevieve. I am a Southern California. I live in West Hollywood with my partner, but I work in San Francisco. So the number, that's why it's a 415. But Herb, H-E-R-B, dot Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z, it's the East Coast way. Um, at hhs.gov, Herb, H-E-R-B, dot Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z. It's 415-265-7049, but I'm here a lot. 415-265-7049. We do a list serve. It's a newsletter once a week. I will never send you a 500-page regulation and say, what do you think about it? <laughs> But we do send about one page once or twice a week. There's lots of funding opportunities, and there's lots of it's all policy-based on what's happening, not just with ACA, although it is our number one priority in this administration for health care. You know, we do have 22 agencies and offices within the Department of Health and Human Services. So you can text me, you can email me, you can call me and say, I want to be on that. But I also want to make sure you, you understand, and, and, and I appreciate every comment that's made, my office is there for 24-7 to be able to ensure that stakeholders, whether governmental or not, can answer your questions, but also can involve you in the implementation of the ACA from the federal government level. And I feel very honored to have the job that I do to work with the secretary and the president that I do. But that's only as good as my being able to relate and talk with, mm -hmm. you know, these folks are phenomenal and I work quite actively with Hask and with Kaiser um, and many of you, but we'd like to work with more. So I'm sorry that I have to run.